What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Today we're here to talk about rookies. Rookies, rookies, rookies. And the ever adapting and ever changing interwebs that we use to do our fantasy football research. There is just so much noise everywhere. Just so many articles, so many blog posts, so many YouTube videos telling you who's good, who sucks, what rookies to draft, what rookies to stay away from. It's hard to decipher, you know, the truth. If any of the rookies are good or, or if they're all on some fraud shit like Charles Ponzi back in the day. And this is more apparent now more so than, than ever with the amount of information that comes out every season. You know, you could read 10 lists of different rookie breakout players with 30 different names on them. That literally helps nobody. Sure, I can I could sit here and list out every rookie running back that came in the league and say, he's on the sleeper list, watch out for him. That literally, it, it, that does no help to anyone. Oh, he's the backup or he's his third string, but I thought he was really talented. Give him an injury and I think he could do something. Like that's the worst analysis you could possibly get from anyone. The problem with how much hype the rookies get nowadays is for every Jordan Howard we have, or even a Tevin Coleman, we have 20 different Matt Joneses, Alex Collinses, Devonta Bookers, Bishop Sankeys, Andre Williams, Jarek McKinnon's, like you get the point, right? Guys that are super hyped up for one reason or another and just never pan out. And the majority of rookies, that's how it works. Like you wouldn't even know most of these guys' names if it weren't for fantasy football. But there's a time and place for everything, including rookies, which is where I come in. Like every other fantasy football player, you should draft players not based on whether or not they're a rookie. You base them on value. What value does is it takes into consideration these ridiculously high upside ceilings that everyone proclaims every rookie has, and it factors into how likely it is that these players actually hit those ceilings or come even close to it. Key word there is the likeliness of them hitting those ceilings. So today we're diving into my top five rookies for 2017 based on value, based on draft position, based on ADP, where they're going and if they are of value there. Let's get cracking. First up on my list, the fifth best value, my boy Joe Mixon out in Cincy, running back at a University of Oklahoma, second round pick. Right now he's going off the board around pick 40. I've seen him go much earlier as the RB17. Now after watching the preseason, it's safe to say that the risk involved with Mixon is very much warranted. Jeremy Hill has been consistently starting with the ones there. And now even Gio Bernard is mixing in. From the eye test, you know, it's nothing we didn't know about Mixon. He looks fantastic when he's on the field, right? Patience, his cutting, his receiving ability to make guys miss, to run through them, to run over them. But it looks like to start the season, it is a true running back by committee. Their head coach, Marvin Lewis, is one that, first of all, I don't even know why he still has a job. Second of all, he just does, he does not like playing rookies until at least they prove it on the field in real games. We look back at, at Jeremy Hill, even Jeremy Hill's dynamite rookie season, right? Started the year slow. During the first seven weeks of, of his rookie season, he averaged just over seven carries a game. For the next nine weeks, he was at around 19.1 carries a game. Even more so when you look at it by way of just overall touches. You know, I've gone over Mixon's outlook or what I think it's going to be my projection for it plenty of times on this channel. It's going to be a clear RBBC to start the season. They'll all probably mix in as the drives go by, but mix in at 6-1, you know, 225, ridiculous size, 4-4, yard uh, dash speed. He's just, he really is the next potential elite back behind the David Johnsons, behind the Le'Veon Bells and, and Zeke Elliott. Basically, it's gonna be a slow start, but I would bet the mortgage that Mixon finishes the season with the most touches in this backfield. I don't think that's that's not a hot take. That's not crazy to say, of course. And I think he'll be getting somewhere between like 15 to 18 touches by week six and even more so as the season progresses. But you definitely need to expect a slow start and, and the risk here is very much warranted with Hill and Geo both in the picture, which is why I have him as my fifth best value. Now, I've seen him go as early as the third round. I'm staying off mixing in the third round. Fourth round is where I would start considering him. Most likely scenario, I'm not actually going to pull the trigger on Mixon unless he drops into the fifth round. Number four, we actually have a combination here because I like both these guys. We got Chris Carson out in Seattle, Marlon Mack out in Indy, probably two lesser 
known named guys here. If you're in not such a competitive league, these guys definitely were not drafted. Carson is out of Oklahoma State. Marlon Mack is out of the University of South Florida. Carson's a seventh round pick, Mack a fourth round pick, and both of their ADPs are basically undrafted, uh, 170 plus. Carson's going after Marlon Mack. I really love both these guys. I think I think they both have major upside, not to be a hypocrite here, but I actually think both of them will get a chance to prove it at one point this season. So we'll start with Carson. He's done nothing but impress this entire summer, including the preseason games, right? He initially started in this backfield as a running back four on the depth chart. So he was all the way down on the list as any as any seventh round rookie would be. But Pete Carroll, their head coach, has been adamant about Carson and saying, you know, he came out right after they drafted him and was just super excited about him, about how how late he's fallen and I think that says something speaking on you know they go out and sign Eddie Lacy they've drafted like three or four running backs in the last year or so so the fact that they they used another draft pick on Chris Carson tells you that at minimum I think they really 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 like the kid and not I mean that's an argument you can make for any team like why the fuck would you pick somebody if you didn't like them but I think Carson is a particular case here. Rawls and Procise have been dealing with their own injuries but Carson has been the most impressive back regardless this preseason when they were out with their injuries, right, it was just him and Eddie Lacy in the backfield in these preseason games. Carson was getting just as much, if not more, run with the first team than Eddie Lacy and was looking e easily, it's not even arguable, way better than Eddie Lacy was. In three preseason games so far, Carson's totaled 156 yards on 25 touches. 64 of the yards came by pass uh, on four catches. So you see that he can contribute both on the ground and in the passing game. Uh, given his size, he's like six foot, 218 pounds. He, he could be a third, uh, three down back, you know, passing, rushing, blocking. He's averaged 4.4 yards per carry this offseason, best among all the Seattle running backs, 3.4 yards after contact, which is also very good. P. Cal came out and said, you know, this, this backfield is completely up for grabs. He has Lacey and Rawls penciled in as the co-starters but one Eddie Lacy is still fat he ain't gonna do shit this year you could you can mark it down Venmo me five bucks if you want to argue about it and Rawls and Procise have just a lengthy injury history so at one point or another Carson will probably get work with the ones even early in the season not a lot but they're definitely gonna see what the kid has and I think he'll be more effective than Lacey and it's likely that either Rawls or Procise goes down with an injury and Carson just creeps up the depth chart until he finally gets his shot I mean he is a seventh round pick but he's got great size like I said he could do a lot of different things 88th percentile burst score 74th percentile spark score so his measurables are good as well what i've been doing a lot is drafting rolls in eighth ninth tenth or later rounds and then grabbing carson in the second to last ish round uh, area for me I've been doing that a lot because I think one of them by the end of the year will be the RB1 there and will provide some huge value for you. But let's move on to Marlon Mack. You know, a lot of the same could be said. He's kind of buried on the depth chart as a fourth round rookie. But for me, I'm erring on the side that Frank Gore is finally on his way out. This is going to be his like parting year. He's 34 years old. He's been really, really bad over the second half of seasons over the, both of the last two seasons so he's slowing down considerably and you're seeing his age finally catch up to him and he just looked really bad at the end of last year you know they have an awful offensive line we have the possibility of luck already missing games so you could bet that he's going to get off to a slow he's basically he's unstartable for me if luck is not in the lineup so you're looking at a slow start for gore as well as a likelihood of him finishing slow do the math just means a slow season when you're slow in the nfl you don't get on the field now they're back up the running back two right behind Gore is Robert Turbin. He was super effective last year on, on minimal touches, but he hasn't proven to be anything more than uh, an effective goal line back here. Turbin is not the answer. He's not the long-term answer for the Colts backfield. That's Marlon Mack. I actually almost expect Turbin to overtake Gore as the starter sooner rather than later, and Mack might be fighting with Turbin for first team reps. In Marlon Mack's two preseason games so far, he has 94 total yards on 15 touches. Uh, he has a 3 for 31 receiving stat line, 5.3 yards per carry, and 4.1 yards after contact. Another guy who could do it all. Good size, 5'11", 215-ish. He has a really athletic build. He almost looks like a, a wide receiver, and I think he probably could play wide receiver, but I love the versatility that he gives luck out of the backfield. To be honest with you, to be completely honest, I'm not even sure I'm comfortable drafting Marlon Mack right now because I think it'll take him a long time to crack the starting lineup. But I think down the stretch, he could be a league winner. I'm talking like second half of the season, just someone to really, really have on your radar. Because once he hits that one big game, 
he's going to be the top waiver wire pickup in all leagues. He's shown he can work all three downs, rushing it, catching the ball, the size good for blocking. He's easily the best pass catching back in this backfield, and the Colts have averaged 110 targets to their running backs over the last three seasons. So the best pass catcher in a team that targets the running back a lot with running upside. I think Mac actually has some early PPR value in deeper leagues, but Definitely someone to keep an eye on in the second half of the season because I think he'll eventually break through. Just to interject real quick before we hit numero three, if you've enjoyed the video so far, please just scroll down and give it a little thumbs up and actually comment also, which out of those two backs, Marlon Mack or Chris Carson, would you rather roster this year? I think that'll be a close one because I like both guys. But yeah, please just scroll down a little, hit that thumbs up button. Number three, we got the homie Dalvin Cook for the Minnesota Vikings. They're running back at FSU, the Seminoles. Oh, round two. Pick 41 for the Vikings. He has shot up draft boards. Going around pick 30 to 33, running back 14. I'm not really sure why it took this long for Dalvin Cook's ADP to shoot up the draft board. Now he's going in like the late third round, but the stage has been set for this rookie. He's gonna get all the opportunity he can handle in Minnesota. There are two glaring red flags. It is Minnesota's offensive line. They're bad, especially on run blocking. And the fact that they signed Latavius Murray through free agency. I had no doubt in my mind, you look back at anything I've published relating to Cook, I had no doubt that within 14 seconds he would take over the starting spot there. As their running back, he is super, 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 super talented, but there's a good chance that Latavius Murray, you know, they went out and signed him, that he's gonna play a role and it's likely going to be the goal line role, the, the end zone touchdown getter. And I think people might be underestimating how big of a role that actually is in this Minnesota offense. Last year, we look back, only LeGarrette Blunt with 24 and David Johnson with 22 had more carries inside the five yard line than Matt Asiata. Matt Asiata, gets 17 goal line rushes. That's so much work in there. And there's a good chance that Latavius Murray becomes that guy for them. Jerick McKinnon had three rushes on the goal line. So he's the only other guy who had a rush down there out of the backfield. So that's not really a lot. Of, they don't like to split those carries, as you can see. So it can mean one of two things for Cook. It can mean that he's m losing out on a lot of value there, you know, from a touchdown perspective. Or it could mean major, major upside if he beats out, you know, if he wins the goal line carries from Murray, which I don't actually expect to happen at least early in the season. The most likely scenario we have here in this backfield is that Dalvin Cook dominates the early down work, dominates the receiving, you know, the pass catching work, and Latavius Murray handles like 70 to 80% of the short yardage work and the goal line carries. You know, Murray, while, while ineffective overall for the Raiders as a running back, over the last two years, he scored 13 goal line touchdowns on just 24 attempts. So he's pretty effective down there. I mean, for what it's worth, I went back to college in terms of Dalvin Cook. I couldn't find how, I couldn't find out how many of these were even goal line rushes. So this, this could be just an irrelevant stat. Cook scored 14 red zone rushing touchdowns for the Seminoles last year. Again, those could be from like 18, 14, 15 yards. So it could have nothing to do with the goal line, but I'm, I'm sure some of them were definitely inside the one, two, three yard line. So he, I'm sure he's shown the ability and the capability to do so. He's on the smaller side. He's around 5'10", 210 pounds. But, but like I've been saying, another Florida State running back. He reminds me a lot of built exactly the same size, almost identical skill set. Devonta Freeman. They're the same guy, people. They're the same dude, and we've seen Freeman have some pretty good success on the goal line. So don't write him off for his size. As for their offensive line, yeah, they're gonna enter 2017 with a better line than they finished with in 2016. It's not saying much though, because they were Pro Football Focus's 29th ranked O-line last year. In run blocking, for football outsiders, they were 30th. So in a, 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 anything improvement would obviously be better than they had last year. It'll probably limit Cooks's you know, yards per carry numbers and overall efficiency, just getting hit behind the line a lot. But I think the overall volume that he's gonna see for rushing work and any receiving work should more than counterbalance that. So you know what, Dalvin Cook, where he's going right now around pick 33, it's it's a little nerve wracking, I guess, because the touch on upside might be limited, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay using my fourth round pick on Dalvin Cook. I'm not sure I would reach into the early third round or even mid third round. Late third round is probably where I'd start contemplating him with the guys like uh, Todd Gurley, Leonard Fournette, and those guys. But owning Cook this year is definitely not gonna be a downside pick. And I'm sure he's falling in a lot of people's drafts that are a little less competitive too. So fourth round or beyond, 
Go ahead. We're chef cooking with the pot. Numero dos. Zay Jones at Buffalo. Their second round pick, wide receiver. Going at pick 127, wide receiver 41. Now, he was also in my top six wide receiver. Sleeper list, ADP of 120 or plus. So if you've seen that, you could probably skip ahead. But I'm just reiterating how much I like Zay Jones, man. He has the clearest path to targets among any rookie wide receiver. Easily. It's not even It's not even arguable. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not arguing his upside here. He doesn't have the same upside as Corey Davis, arguably Mike Williams, depending on if he comes back or not. But both are banged up. And then you look at other, you know, top rated rookies. We have John Ross in Cincy. We have Taewon Taylor in Tennessee. Those guys all have heavy competition. They have better uh, targets ahead of them on their team and a lot less clear path to targets, which is why I really like Zay Jones. I mean, I, I was really high on him when they drafted him. This summer has been a roller coaster ride for me in terms of his value, right? When they first initially drafted him, he was only behind Sammy Watkins. I loved it. Boom. Then Anquan Bolden signs through for agency, and I'm like, eh, he takes a, a bit of a dip. Then Sammy Watkins gets traded, and I'm like, let's go. Then Jordan Matthews joins the team. Boo. And Bolden retires. Yay. And Matthews chips his sternum or whatever he does. And I'm like, all right, you know what? Zay Jones is the only consistent piece here in this offense. Jones is back in business after all the nonsense is said and done. I've covered Jones as a prospect before on my channel. You could see from his workout measurables. He tests off the chart basically everywhere, right? Six foot, 210 pounds, 445 speed. So great speed for his size, burst, agility, catch radius, spark score. They're all there along with his college production. He set the FBS reception record last year with 158 catches on 164 targets. So he dropped six balls on 164 targets. That's why he was a second round pick. College production, measurables, and now he gets the opportunity. You see with all the moves that they made this offseason, the Bills are clearly cleaning house, getting ready to rebuild. When all said and done, you know what? They ended up with a pretty good setup for next year's draft. Two first round picks, two second round picks, two third round. Safe to say they're going to retarnish this offense. With Watkins gone, and clearly they don't trust Tyrod. They don't trust anyone at their quarterback position. They don't have, I don't know, they, they're not an ideal situation for quarterback. They don't like Tyrod Taylor. For this foreseeable foreseeable future 2017 they are very 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 much set up to be a short passing offense they get rid of Watkins he was our only deep threat and now they have Jordan Matthews and Zay Jones both short yardage kind of guys Zay Jones excels on the screen passes the slants that's where he had all of this production basically that's why he had 158 catches last year to me it's clear that they want to get Zay Jones the ball short yardage and it's clear that he's going to be a big piece of this offense going forward that's why they drafted him and, and, and he's going to be part of their rebuild now Jordan Matthews is slated to play in week one, right? Basically, his only competition at wide receiver. But he's practiced for about 12 minutes. So hopefully, he's learned the playbook. He'll have zero timing with Tyrod Taylor, zero chemistry with that offense, right? He came over and he he messed up his sternum in the first practice. So he's had no field time with his new team. When all is said and done, it's probably going to be a 1A, 1B situation with Matthews and Zay Jones. And I think Zay Jones is the 1A there. He's a great bet to lead the team in targets and receptions and probably lead all rookies in targets and receptions as well. So I'll take that in the 13th round, all Zay. I mean, all day. PPR leagues, grab your boy Zay Jones. And we move over to the number one value this year from the rookies. It's Kareem Hunt. It's Kareem motherfudging Hunt. Kansas City Chiefs running back, University of Toledo, third round pick, ADP. I don't even know at this point because it's changed so rapidly since the wear scenario. I've seen him go in third rounds. I've seen him go in fifth rounds. I am drafting him in the third round where I can get him. Hunt has easily the clearest path to touches of all running backs in the rookie class. Following the Spencer Ware knee injury that's gonna have him out for the entire year, right? You could argue Dalvin Cook maybe, but I'd much prefer a running back in the Andy Reid offense than one behind that Minnesota Vikings offensive line, which has been really bad for years now. And, you know, Cook's obviously not guaranteed the goal line work there. So Hunt is, for the fact that Cook is going around pick 30 and Hunt is in a way better situation, that should tell you something. Now, the Chiefs line per Pro Football Focus is ranked 15 entering this year. They were 17th per Football Outsiders in run blocking last season. But they both had little write-ups that said they improved steadily as the year went on, and they're expecting them to take another jump this year with continuity and having the same starters in the mix. Now, we looked at Cook's goal line situation. It's not it's not great, right? They had a tendency to use Asiata and use their bigger backs near the end zone. Now, you look at Kareem Hunt, build-wise. He's 5'11"-ish, 220, around that size. Much closer in size to Spencer Ware, who's 5'10", 225 to 230, than Charkandrick West is. Charkandrick West, most people probably don't really know this, but he's actually on the smaller size for backs. 5'10", around 2 105 pounds, so he's much slimmer than Kareem Hunt is. Now, size is definitely not the end-all be-all for me. I'm not just like, oh, he's big, he's fat. 
get them on the goal line. But Reed, Andy Reed, their head coach, has shown a tendency to use the bigger back. We could look at the last two seasons where Ware and Tarkandrick West West were both here in this offense. Spencer Ware had 16 rushes on the goal line compared to Tarkandrick West's 10. So even if they're at a 60-40 split, it's way better than what you'd get out of Dalvin Cook. And it doesn't hurt that the Chiefs average four points more per game than the Vikings do overall on offense. And if you're worried about Hunt staying upright, if you're like, oh, he's a rookie, he hasn't proven it, whatever, don't be. He dealt with like a one, maybe two minor bang-ups in college. He missed two to four games throughout his entire college career, and he stayed until his senior year. So that's four years. He's averaged 21 touches per game from his sophomore year through his through his senior year, uh, and that included an injury-free senior year in 2016 where he touched the ball 303 times. So he's more than capable of handling a full workload and being the three down back there. You look at other guys you could draft around where Hunt is going. I'm assuming his ADP is probably around 25 to 30 in that range in more savage leagues. I would gladly take Hunt over Gurley, Fournette, Christian McCaffrey, Isaiah Crowell. You know, game script, scoring opportunities, third down and passing down work, goal line work. Those are all concerns for the guys I just listed. Kareem Hunt has none of those concerns. He's the clearest path to touches out of all those guys. Clearest path to being a three down back there, to goal line work, to receiving work in a good offense. Look at Gurley, Fournette, Crowell, all in shitty offenses. How many scoring opportunities are they really going to get? Is Fournette even going to be the third down back? Is Gurley going to bounce back? Who knows? Christian McCaffrey, is he going to get any 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 goal line touches? How many rushes is he going to get? What happens if he get eight carries a game? So if Hunt could stay healthy, you're getting him at his floor, right? You're getting him around RB12, RB13, and there's no reason he can't finish as the top eight running back in fantasy this season. So I love, I absolutely love Hunt, and I will be targeting there in the thirdish round because he adds a, a running back to the mix right where you want to draft a guy where other guys don't give you the same floor and ceiling as Hunt does. So in those in that mid third round, I always find myself kind of like eh, in a in a doozy, right? Because I don't want to reach for any of these running backs, and I don't particularly love any of the wide receivers there either. So Hunt cements himself as as like that mid third round pick for me. So that's gonna wrap up the video. I want to say you know the channel has been flying off the charts these last couple days. Uh, I've been growing very quickly. And I'm actually getting to the point where I can't handle everyone's comments, tweets, emails, and things like that. I'm trying my best to get around to everybody's to, you know, the rate my teams or whatever, things like that. But I'm not sure I can get to everyone's. And I apologize if, if I don't. I try my best to do it. Also, if you are going to do that, if you're going to send me like a full squad breakdown and stuff, make sure you put the league size and the scoring format PPR standard. because. If you send me one and then I check it, be specific as possible and that way I won't have to come back and ask you questions. And yeah, that's gonna wrap it up. So scroll down. If you didn't already hit the thumbs up button, please do that. You can leave a comment down below if you want and uh, I'll see y'all on the next episode. Also, apparel, clothing, whatever, available on my site. <laughs>